morning, everyone. If you want to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, that'll be the first passage that we read this morning. I was about 30 seconds before uh, William said he wanted to sing another song. I was thinking in my head, I wish we could just finish out the service singing. Um, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but that's exactly what I was thinking before he, he said that. So, yeah, I never mind, like, taking my time away <laughs> of anything uh, for singing. Uh, so that was good. Uh, another housekeeping thing. I've handed a bunch of you a sheet of paper this morning. Uh, it's got three words on it. So it's pretty simple, um, but it's important. Uh, at the end of September, Scott and I need to put together uh, some theme ideas, sermon ideas, class ideas, and give those back to the, the worship team uh, for presentation to the, the congregation for next year's theme. And we want input from you guys. Uh, if you have some passages that you think would be good for pulling a theme from, um, put, those, put those down there. Uh, and then if you, if you want to pull the theme out yourself, you know, kind of make that clear on the, on the piece of paper. Uh, I would like you to give those back to me in the next three weeks. So if you get it done tonight, you can give it to me Thursday. But um, about middle of September, Scott and I are going to start putting our heads together and, and trying to get the ideas together for the group. So just want to get feedback from you if you have it. So last year... Um, we studied the armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6. And Blake's brought that up a couple of times. As he was preaching through Ephesians, he's like, we're not going to go into chapter 6 because we kind of studied that. And I'm not going to do that this morning either. Um, chapter 6 is going to serve as our basis for, for the verses, but we're not really going to focus on the armor itself necessarily. Uh, we will read those verses. Um, but when we were studying that last year, there, there was a thought that stuck in my head that I have been not wrestling with, but I've been kind of just chewing on uh, since, it's been almost a year. When I went back and looked, I think we, we did this class in August, September time frame of last year. Um, and that is that our battles are not against flesh and blood. Um, and we, we've heard that said, and, and there are other verses that talk about it. We'll read, we'll read a couple. Um, but it, it's, if you really think about it and you really put yourself you know, into your daily routine, your daily life. It doesn't always feel that way. But let, let's just read two verses from Ephesians 6 first, verses 11 and 12. And Paul sort of introduces the, the thought here um, of the armor that he's going to get to in a second. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. Paul says, Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Well, that, all, that, that sounds kind of overwhelming. Uh, I, I, I don't even know what all of those things are, <laughs> but that's where my battle is. Um, there's, another, there's another passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 where Paul says something similar. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. Now, I'm, I'm pulling these verses out of the middle of a thought, but that's because I just want to get the facts out of these verses, okay? Verses 4 and 5 of chapter 10. Paul says, For the weapons, he's not talking about our battle now, he's talking about our weapons. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying arguments and all arrogance raised against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So Paul is clear, you know, when he writes to the Ephesians, he's clear when he writes to the Corinthians. The real warfare, the battle that's taking place is on a spiritual level. Um, and it's, it's not taking place in our flesh. So I, I'm just, I'm going to give, I actually am going to have three points in this sermon. That doesn't mean it's going to be long. It's actually pretty short. So we're going to be done quite early today. Um, but there's three observations I want to, I want to take from my, my pondering this, this idea. One is, the first one is obvious. Uh, this paradigm is really hard to adopt. I have found, okay, for me. Because it, it, it feels like the battle is in the flesh. 
uh, and it feels like the battle is against the flesh. Um, I was at I was at a mall yesterday. I don't go to malls very often, but I was just like surrounded by women who had essentially painted on their clothes, and I just felt like I was under attack the whole time, like my mind, you know, because their clothes were covering as much of their body as what paint would cover if they had painted their bodies. And I don't know if women understand this, but men understand this. That's, that's hard for a man to deal with all the time. So that felt like the battle was in the flesh. It was like, okay, the battle is I need to convince you to go put on some clothes and dress yourself properly, or I need to, like, never go to a mall again. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it feels like it's a physical thing, right? It's in the flesh. There's something physical I need to do, barriers, sunglasses, blinders, right? Whatever. Um, but it's not. And it's, I'm not saying that it's not because I have some, like, epiphany. It's not because I just read that it's not. The battle wasn't happening in the mall. Um, so I, I have an example. I, I, I wasn't going to use this example, but I, I was talking with Kelly, and he kind of talked me into it. I, I, think it's, I think it works. It's a good example. So Alice and Bob are a married couple. Christians, they're, they're Christians. Bob's a big Messi fan, and he's really upset that Messi left Barcelona and he's gone to play for PSG. So he's having a bad day. You know, Bob's in a bad mood. He's, sit, he's, he's sitting on the couch and he's watching all the news about Messi leaving Barcelona to go play for PSG. And Alice comes walking through and she's got something on her mind. She bumps into the coffee table and knocks his drink over and he just, he just erupts. He like explodes. You know, why do you have to be so clumsy? Why are you so clumsy? Something to, to that effect, right? Whatever. Very harsh. Not, not kind at all. Um, so in this example, a battle has just begun. But it's not the battle that we think. It's not between Bob and Alice. There's a, there's a battle happening within Alice right now. The battle that is starting is within her. And, like, I identify with that because, like, I, I know what I would do in her shoes, or I, I know what I would want to do in her shoes, right? Retaliate. Okay, you want to call me clumsy? Well, let's start the list for you. All right, let's go through every way that you're not perfect. Let's go through every way that you have somehow made my day bad, right? That's what the flesh wants. That's what, if you, if you go back to, you know, it's Ephesians 6, 11, and 12, that's what these, these rulers, these powers, these forces of darkness, that's actually what they want. It's not just what your flesh wants. I mean, uh, again, I'm, I'm just inferring this from what Paul has written. This is what the, the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, that's what they want for you, is for you to side with the flesh and retaliate. That's what they want for Alice in this example. Alice, you know Bob's not perfect. Just lay into him. Right? You're, you're better than him anyway. Make sure he knows it. Right? Yeah, okay, so you, you knocked over his drink. What are all of the worst things, much worse things that he's done in your relationship? Right? That's the battle that's happening in Alice right now. Right? So if you take... take my day yesterday, the battle that was happening it wasn't in the mall, it was within me. It's like, what am I going to do with this onslaught of bodies around me, right? Am I, gonna, am I going to lust? Am I going to stare? Am I going to feed the flesh? Or am I going to fight the battle with the armor that I have, right? So, The interesting thing here is what we sometimes think is the battle. Like if you think about Bob and Alice, like the battle is he yelled at her and she's going to yell back or not or whatever. What we actually see and hear are the results of the battles. And, and other people, right? Not, not our own. Our own battles we feel, we see, we hear, right? They're happening within us. But... What we see in other people, in the interactions with other people, are the results of the battles. So imagine Alice feeds the flesh, and she just, she just goes at him. And she's had a bad day too, 
Maybe that's why she's in a rush, right? She's running from one thing to another thing, and she bumped into a table. And she probably hurt her knee, <laughs> right? So what we see when we see Alice attack Bob verbally is we see the result of a lost battle. She lost the battle. We're not seeing the battle happen because it's already happened. What we're seeing is the outcome. On the other hand, right, if she, if she wins the battle, right, and, you know, maybe in her mind she says, okay, this is not normal for him. He doesn't do this. I know, I know him better than this. Something is, like, really bothering him, you know. And she sits down and she says, okay, so what's wrong? I know it's not, I know it's not a soccer player. Right. I mean, there might be something like more, uh, a deeper issue that Bob's having and just this aggravation with something that brought it to the surface, right? And so when we see her do that, we don't see a battle taking place. Oh, she's winning the battle. No, she already won the battle. The battle's over. She won the battle, and what we're seeing are the results of a victory, Right? Um, so, and Kelly, Kelly pointed this out so, yesterday so quickly when we were talking about it, so I'm going to go ahead and point it out now. What you saw in Bob was a lost battle, right? I thought I was so clever I was going to save that to like the end or something, but Kelly was like, oh, Bob lost his battle. I was like, okay, well, if it's that obvious, I'm going to bring it up early in the sermon then too. So that, what, what you saw from Bob when he just you know, yelled at his wife, was he lost a battle. Um, so the, the whole point of, of this example is, was at least to, to explain to you why I find this paradigm so hard to adopt. Because it feels like the battle is the argument. It feels like the battle is interaction with the other people or other person. It feels like the battle is happening in here where I can see and touch things. But Paul is, is crystal clear. He can't be any more clear that it's not. And so my only conclusion is it's got to be happening before all that other stuff. right? And all of that other stuff is just the result. That's what we see. Um, so, And I think this pattern actually, it generally fits like the idea of temptation and sin, right? Something creates a battle within us, creates this, and again, if you think about James 1, right, there's something, some external stimulus, right, that creates a battle within us, that is outside, right, creates this battle because we have temptations, we have desires within us, and if we lose that battle, we sin, right, that's the idea of temptation giving birth to sin, right, and sin giving birth to death, but here's the thing, the same thing you saw with Bob and Alice, when we lose these battles, um, we often create a battle for someone else. Did you notice when Bob lost his battle, he created a battle for Alice that wouldn't have been there otherwise. He put his own wife in a spiritual predicament because he lost his battle. Now, it's not a very serious thing, right? It's like they're, having, they're, they're in a bad mood. But I'm saying, like, it is a serious thing. Because like the one person who should be protecting her spiritual welfare was the one who put her in a spiritual predicament because he lost his battle. And it's not just married couples. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm just saying generally, when we lose our battles, the people around us are often put into a battle themselves. If we win... Not only do we become stronger for the next battle, right? Um, but we spare the people around us from having to fight a battle that we would have created. And I, I want to pause here and say, like, you know, I mean, we are not fighting Satan on our own. What we're talking about is putting on the armor that God has given us, okay? Like, Richard does not extinguish the fiery darts of Satan, the shield of faith extinguishes the fiery darts of Satan. But Richard has to take up the shield. You see? 
The shield doesn't have a mind. The shield doesn't make decisions. I make the decisions. So I'm the one fighting the battle. The shield is not fighting the battle. I'm fighting the battle. But if I don't have the shield, I'm going to lose. If I don't have the breastplate, I'm going to lose. If I don't have the helmet of salvation, the battle's over. I'm going to lose. So I don't want to give this impression that, like, Somehow we are strong enough that we overcome Satan on our own, and then, like, you know, God is blessed to have us on his side or some, something like that. I mean, that's not what we're talking about. He's given us something to use in battle. We need to prepare ourselves for it. Okay, so that's the first observation. I think the paradigm is hard to adopt. But I think the power of it, if you adopt that paradigm, is massive. Like, you see people differently. You see your interactions with people differently. Like, man, if I win this battle, I can spare this person the battle that I would have created if I retaliate. Okay, the second, um, the second observation is uh, the armor makes much more sense, I think, if we have this correct paradigm. So let's, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6 and read the, the, the full passage that includes the armor description. And again, we're not going to go through all the pieces of armor. We did that uh, less than a year ago. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 11, Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In our example, Alice uh, doesn't have time to stop and put on all that armor while she's under attack. If she hasn't suited up for the day, for the battles that she's going to face, she's going to fall. I mean, we understand this from a physical sense. <laughs> a guy does not go into battle, you know, wearing his flip-flops and decide that once he comes under fire, he's going to suit up. The flip-flops are comfortable, so I'm going to wear flip-flops until, you know, until the, the, I can hear gunfire. That's insane. I mean, physically, that, that's completely insane. But somehow we think that that's t perfectly sane spiritually. Oh, I don't need to worry about truth because I'm having a good day. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not facing temptation, so why should I think about righteousness? You have no idea when your next battle is coming. None. Not at all. It could happen in the next five seconds when you get a text. You have no idea. So if you think about, right, the value of truth for Alice or the value of righteousness for Alice in her situation, right, if she was already steeped in it, right, thinking about truth, thinking about righteousness, thinking about the character of God, right, the shield of faith, all of these things, well, she's much more likely to respond in a way that says, wow, Bob just lost a battle. This is serious. I wonder what I can do to help strengthen him for his next battle. You see, like, she doesn't even think about herself whatsoever at all. Right? Her, her, her aching knee, because she hit the coffee table, because she was suited up. It was, I'm not saying she didn't feel hurt. I'm sure she did. I would have. Somebody yells at me, calls me clumsy because I... I accidentally do something. But that's where all the armor comes in, in handy. That's why the armor is useful. Is because it's the first thing that it hits. Instead of hitting you, it, the, the attack hits the armor first, you see? That's the whole point of it. And it gives you time to think and say, oh, my armor just got hit. Well, what can I do to help? Right? Um, 
So we need to make sure that we're prepared for our battles, but we also need to recognize them when they're happening, right? Um, when we're tempted to, if we're tempted to lie in a situation, right, that we need, we need to say, okay, truth, now's the time for truth, right? And, and think about the belt of truth, how valuable truth is. And God is truth, right? There is no lie in him. Um, we're, when we're, we're tempted to lust, right, we, we need that breastplate of righteousness that says, no, you have a relationship with God where he has made you right, and you value that being right. You value that righteousness that he has given to you as a gift because of the sacrifice of his son. There's nothing that you, will, you want to engage in that God wouldn't engage in, right? So, yeah, in the moment, you want to recognize what the battle's about, but you don't want to have to, like, say, oh, man, is this, is this really so bad? Or, you know, how, how far can I go down this road and this line of thinking? No, you need to have truth. You need to have righteousness. You need to have faith. You need to be ready for the battle. When we're tempted to anger, right, like maybe Alice was, um, peace will be the most important thing, right? Shod your feet with the, gospel, the preparation of the gospel of peace, right? The gospel makes peace. So that should define you. You know, even Paul's words, I think, in, in, in this uh, implies, like, preparation and constantly being suited up, right? He says, so that you will be able to resist, right? You're doing something now, not so that you can resist now, so that you can resist upcoming in the future. Um, stand firm having girded, right? You, you did this in the past, right? Now he's talking about, okay, now I am standing firm. Why am I standing firm? Because in the past, I girded myself with the belt of truth. That happened. Having shod, having put on, will be able to extinguish. So, I mean, I, I know, like, we understand this concept. This concept is easier than maybe adopting the, the paradigm correctly, but but this concept, I think, just because we understand it doesn't mean we do it. This isn't just like, I, I know things in the Bible. That's not what this is. this is. This is valuing truth so much that it affects your actions. This is valuing righteousness and having it so close to your chest that it changes your responses to the world around you. I mean, it actually it affects you. You can't, in good conscience, react in a certain way anymore because you value righteousness so much. Now, yes, you do need to know things in the Bible. Like, you have to, because you have to know what truth is. You have to know what, what is right and what is wrong. But knowing those things is not going to be enough. You have, to, you have to value those things. You have to hold on to those things. Okay. We're not battling people. We're not even battling perception. What we're battling against are ideas and temptations that arise within ourselves. Did you notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, um, it's not clear that Paul's really talking about internal stuff until you get to the very end of verse 5 when he says, we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That only happens inside you. You can't take other people's thoughts captive, ever. If You know, it, First, it seems like maybe he's talking about our, our, our approach to the world, right? We are, we are, our, our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We're destroying arguments. Okay, there we go. Some our argument arises over here, and I go and destroy it. Uh, we're, we're destroying all arrogance that raises itself against the knowledge of God. Okay, I'm ready for that. Show me an arrogant person, and I'm going to go cut him off at the knees. <clears throat> But then you keep reading, it's like, oh, taking every thought captive. It's actually talking about me the whole time. Any argument that arises within me against God, I have the tools from God to destroy that argument. Any arrogance that arises within me against God, I have the weapons to destroy that arrogance. I have the weapons to take every thought in my mind captive to Christ. I have the weapons. Now I'm saying weapons, and that's in Second Corinthians terminology. Ephesians terminology is I have the defenses, I have the armor. But it's the same idea. Okay, the third 
third and final uh, observation, and, and we mentioned this earlier, is that successful battles are powerful. Successful battles are powerful. So, so think about the state of the world. Let's, we've thought about ourselves, so that's good. We need to keep thinking about ourselves. But now think about the state of the world for a second. Do you think most people that you meet are winning or losing their battles? I know what the answer is. There's no doubt in my mind. I know for a fact what the answer is. They're losing their battles. Why would I be so certain about that? You can only win with the armor of God. You cannot win a battle without the armor of God. So most of the people that you interact with have lived an entire life of losing every battle they've ever faced. Or, more commonly, I think, never even fighting it. I don't want to fight the battle. Why would I fight the battle? It makes the flesh feel good. Why would I not lust? I mean, I go to the mall just for the mall. Why would I, why would I fight a battle there? I think if we have that idea, like we think about people having either, having either losing, spend an entire life losing battles or just at some point giving up and saying, I'm, I'm going to stop fighting battles anymore. I think, at least for me, that helps me say, you know what, I need to win a battle just so someone can see what it looks like to, have a, to win a battle. I need to win a battle just so someone knows it's possible that a battle can be won. Right? Like showing compassion to someone who attacks you, right? In the midst of the attack, you show compassion to someone and, or, or, or kindness or gentleness or whatever. Everyone around you is going to just, like, freak out. Maybe not externally, but internally. They're going to freak out. What just happened? Why is he acting this way? Why is he stopping me from retaliating on his behalf? What is going on here? It is going to be so foreign to them to see someone win a battle that you're going to create an entire platform for teaching or conversation or influence that you didn't even have just by winning a battle. And it's not always in reaction, right? Sometimes it's like there's just someone in need, and you're the, you're the first person that steps up to supply the need. And other people are like, well, what made you do that? Like, why, why? Well, you had a battle within yourself. You said, you know what, I don't have time for this. Well, I'm going to make time for this. Okay, let's, let's, let's make time for another person that's created in the image of God. You won a battle. And people didn't see the battle, but they see the result. Winning those battles is powerful. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, just to make, make the point more clear, John says, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Well, we know John's not talking about trees and birds. Trees don't lie in the power of the evil one. It's people. So you can bring those people out of that, that sway, out of that influence by winning battles that God has equipped you for. I mean, you, you don't even have to like figure out like, how do I go find a battle and how do, I, how do I become successful? No, the battles come to you and God's given you the armor. You just have to win the battle. And that has a very powerful impact. So the world, they're not equipped to win any battles. But they can see you win them. You, you don't react the way that they do or the way they see other people react. You proactively go out of your way to ease someone else's burden. There's no way for you to know the impact your successes will have. You can't, you can't know. I mean, sometimes after the fact, like maybe someone, very rarely, if someone comes up and says, oh, you said this, or you, I saw you do this, you know, 10 years ago, and that changed the whole course of my life. I've never had anyone say that to me, <laughs> okay? But God works that way because other people have had that impact on me. I know, I know he works that way. And so that's what I want you to think about for this, for, for this third point is think about the impact others' successes when they've won battles. Think about when they've won battles, the impact it had on you. 
Because you've had people in your life who've won battles. Try to think about the impact it had on you. Uh, I know for me, like I've been humbled and shamed uh, by the successes others have had in their lives because it showed me that I was choosing to lose my battles. There's no excuse to lose a battle. There isn't. Not as a Christian. There's no excuse. So I'm talking about like as a Christian, being next to someone who, who wins a battle and I see the result of their, their success and I'm like, man, that could have been me if I had made the right decision. And that helped me. I'm not saying that was, that was, a, great, that was a good experience. It felt terrible in the moment because it exposed me in the fact that I, I wasn't suiting up. I didn't have the shield of faith or I didn't have the breastplate of righteousness. But that person's success had a good impact on me. And I can tell you the vast majority of the times, I never go to them and tell them that. I mean, I think I, I'm not saying I shouldn't. I think I, I should. That would help them, right? But you're not going to know. So I knew in those moments I didn't have to lose my battles. Your successes will have that effect on other people both in shining a light to those who are tired of losing battles, but also strengthening your brethren who, who shouldn't be losing them in the first place. So those are the three points. Now I just have a, a very short conclusion. So here, here's the conclusion, kind of two points. We need to adopt a mindset of preparation and being armed for battle but not against people. We need to be prepared for the battles that are going to rise within us because of the way people treat us or the things we see happening around us. And we need to be prepared to win those battles, make a conscious decision to win that battle. And we need to look at battles as an opportunity to practice with God's armor, right? To put it on and say, okay, this is what it feels like to, you know, have truth and righteousness and salvation on and faith, right? This is what it feels like to fight a battle with these things, right? Well, you need to keep doing that, keep practicing with it. And it's also an opportunity to be an example of success to those around you. Not so that you can glorify yourself, right? It's the, it's the exact opposite. It's so that you can extol the excellencies of the one who outfitted you for the battle, right? Someone comes to you and says, wow, you know, you did so great. Or, you, you know, it's like, well, you know, God has given me truth to rely on. I know what, I, I know what would have happened if I didn't have truth with me. I know what would have happened in that situation if I didn't have righteousness with me, if I didn't have salvation with me. I know what would have happened, right? But God has given me these things, and he can outfit anybody else with these things for those same victories. Okay. That's my sermon. It's 11 o'clock and I'm done. <laughs> I hope that was useful for you guys. Um, I'm, as you can probably tell, I'm not even really done thinking through these things. This has been something I've just been, it's been on my mind since that class last year and I'm still working on it. Um, particularly point one, like adopting that, that paradigm and making sure that I really think that way. Um, so if, I mean, th this isn't really like a, uh, an invitation type, type lesson, but um, for, for those of you who are Christians here, if you have found that you've been losing these battles, just let somebody know. Everyone here has lost battles. We need to, we need to strengthen each other, and we need to know if someone is consistently losing battles, not so that we can rebuke, but so that we can shore up. We can step beside and help strengthen each other. William's going to sing us, uh, lead us in a final song, and then we'll be dismissed. <laughs>